Fort William First Nation tries to stop Horizon Wind. Frank Van Trova turns himself into police. And Thunder Bay welcomes 53 new Canadian citizens. Good evening and thank you for joining us. A controversial wind farm proposed on the Norwestern Mountain Range has hit another hurdle. Lawyers on behalf of the Fort William First Nation are calling on the province to prohibit Horizon Wind from accessing and developing on treaty lands. The First Nation has raised numerous concerns over the project, including protection of land and the Loch Lomond watershed. Court documents allege the Crown has also failed its obligation to consult Fort William on the development. Dennis Ward has the latest. The Big Thunder Wind Park is the focus of new court challenges. The Fort William First Nation has filed notice of applications for judicial review against two provincial ministries. First Nation is calling on the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing to quash the Horizon Wind lease of treaty lands. Fort William also says Municipal Affairs has refused to consult with and protect treaty and Aboriginal rights. The First Nation also has some requests of the Ministry of the Environment. Fort William is looking to stop the MOE from approving Horizon's renewable energy application until the Ministry has fulfilled its constitutional obligations to consult. Horizon contends it has consulted Fort William First Nation and public meetings were held. Those were enough to satisfy the MOE, which deemed the company's REA complete nearly one year ago. But Fort William believes it is the sole responsibility of the province to do the consulting, something the MOE says it has done and continues to do. Horizon spokesperson Kathleen McKenzie doesn't feel the latest actions by Fort William will set the project back. She says the company is eager to begin construction once it receives the final approval. Dennis Ward, TBT News. A Thunder Bay man who failed to show up at his trial for charges of criminal negligence causing bodily harm has now been located. 57-year-old Frank Van Troba turned himself in at the city police station. He's now facing an additional charge of failure to appear in court. A warrant was issued when he didn't show up for the start of his three-day trial at Superior Court on Tuesday. The original charges are related to a dog mauling of a young boy at Tarbit Park in November of 2012. 11-year-old Dante Mackinac required 65 stitches to his face after he was attacked by one of six dogs who were unleashed at the time. Van Trobel was walking the dogs and allegedly left the scene shortly after the incident took place. Officials at the Crown Attorney's Office say his trial will now have to be rescheduled for a later date. The Ontario Human Rights Commission is launching a new policy on removing the so-called Canadian Experience Barrier. Many newcomers to the country often turn to volunteering or low-skilled jobs to meet the Canadian experience requirement, and the Chief Commissioner says that results in discrimination. The Commission held a workshop on the new policy in Thunder Bay today. Chief Commissioner Barbara Hall says it shouldn't matter where a person gains their experience as long as they have the right skill sets and are competent, and believes the strict requirements is discriminatory. The way they get uh, through the immigration process is because they're skilled people and they arrive in Canada and then often they're put into a catch-22 uh, situation. They go to apply for jobs and they're asked for Canadian experience, which clearly they don't have. All adds people who experience these situations should file human rights complaints. She believes removing the barrier is good for employers who have a larger pool of professionals to choose from and good for newcomers and their families so they can work in their area of expertise. Well, over 50 new Canadian citizens were sworn in this morning at the ceremony held at Lakehead University's Law School. Some have been residents of the country for decades. Others are newcomers. TBT's Phil Darlington has the story. Lakshmi Patak's family received their Canadian citizenship today. They moved to Canada from Nepal four years ago and have been living in Thunder Bay for three. I, we were in Brampton for a couple of months, maybe four months, and then we went to Aurelia, worked there for, a, for let's say, eight months, and then came back to, I mean, came to Th Thunder Bay. Patak is still waiting on his citizenship as he's not been in the country quite long enough. 
but being from an educational background helped with the transition. There was a fast track immigration process. I used to be a university teacher, and there was a special category for university teachers. So I applied and then thought of doing something good for the kids and myself. I'm a Lakehead PhD student now, and this is my first year there. And we, are, we have been very happy and doing wonderful. In charge of the whole ceremony is a Canadian immigrant himself. Citizenship Judge Harry Dollywall has been through many ceremonies like this and knows what the attendees are feeling. You talk to them, you have, uh, you sort of listen to their stories a little bit, you know, they are very, very uh, happy and they have a genuine gratitude in their heart that Canada has really accepted them as a Canadian citizen. I'm proud to be uh, Portuguese, but also very, very proud to be Canadian and this has been a very emotional and joyous time for me and uh, I just, um, I'm glad to be here today. It's a special day. So what comes next for Patak and his family? Fully integrate into Canadian culture, and they will be practicing home culture as well, so they will have to balance a kind, you know. They will have to balance and then enjoy diversity and live with their differences. So I believe they will have a better access to the world now. For many of the new citizens, a lot of integration has already taken place as they've been living in Canada for a while. But the general feeling is that there's still a lot more to come. Bill Darlington, TVT News. High school students have been going on field trips for as long as anyone can remember, but maybe never one this prestigious. Almost 50 students and teachers from St. Ignatius and St. Patrick High Schools left for Europe today. They'll be there to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the start of the First World War, the 75th anniversary of the Second World War, and the 70th anniversary of the Normandy landing. Mike Albany's reports. Traveling to Europe is almost never cheap, but the students partaking in this history-filled trip raised enough money to go. That is a good sign according to David Battistel, a St. Pat's history teacher who says he is impressed with the hard work and determination to learn. It's fantastic to see that, that kids are willing to do this. Uh, you know, we had the experience two years ago and it's just, just amazing to see the kids take in history. Uh, probably one of my touching moments from a couple of years ago was, was, uh, was going to a Canadian war cemetery and, and, and watching high school students in tears. Uh, as they walked around and, and looked at the headstones. So it's just, it's remarkable to see that, and remarkable that they're, that they're this interested in history to, to want to do this. According to Battistel, history is much more memorable when you can touch and interact with it. That's why this trip is going to be so meaningful for the kids. And they are aware of this, and hope they can learn to appreciate the sacrifices made by the Canadian soldiers more than they already do. Some of the things they went through were just absolutely horrible, um, but it ended up having a good outcome. Uh, and it's just so interesting because it's so different than the way things are now, uh, being able to see how that all worked. They sacrificed a lot for us, so, no, we can do a lot now, which we probably couldn't do if they didn't go over there, so, it's, yeah, it's important. Just experience um, part of the history about Canada and what made us great and able to overcome all our problems in the war. The Canada's Battlefields tour includes stops in Amsterdam and Normandy along with a number of other famous war cemeteries where Canadian soldiers are buried. Well, we're flying into Amsterdam, and we're going to be seeing things like Anne Frank's house. Uh, we're going to be visiting several Canadian cemeteries. We'll be visiting places like Eeps, uh, Vimy Ridge, Dieppe, uh, Juno Beach, Paris. Grade 11 student Sarah Fisick says her teacher's passion has shown them how great history can be, and she even went as far as to describe her friends as giant history nerds. Definitely, I'd say 50-50 for Europe and the history. It's, the culture's going to be so interesting, but so is seeing all the battlefields and locations like that. You know, it's a 50-50 split right now. 60-40 for just Europe, kind of that general experience of it. The history is pretty cool and interesting too, but mostly just the whole experience of going overseas. The trip will last 10 days, and students say they can't wait to visit the places where so many Canadians sacrifice their lives to create a better world. Mike Albanese, TBT News. Students at Vance Chapman Public School had a chance to walk through history today using a giant floor map. The Canadian Geographic Education tool features forts, historical towns, battle sites and for First Nation villages that served as the stage for the War of 1812. Middle school teacher Robin Bowles says it was a great way to get students to learn about the War of 1812 in an interactive way. We engaged and immersed. They actually walked in the path of the various people involved in our history and to be immersed in that it's very tangible, it's very hands-on and interactive. It feels like you're actually in the War of 1812 like because it has so much detail and it shows where the border is and we it also shows where 
the crossings of Upper and Lower Canada and where they end and start. There are five sets of these giant floor maps currently traveling around the country and Bowles says their school has had one for three weeks now. It was produced by the Royal Canadian Geographical Society and it's the first of its kind. It was created in an effort to promote an immersive learning environment as well as to encourage students to explore Canada's history through geography. You may have heard that one great gesture can change someone's life, but you may not see it every day. Well, it took just one letter to Canadian Tire to give a Thunder Bay boy his dream day at his favorite place. Philip Morose is an 11-year-old boy living with autism, and he loves Canadian Tire, so much so that he even had his birthday cake themed after it. His older sister, Chantelle, sent an email to Canadian Tire telling them how big of a fan he was, and they decided to make him an honorary Canadian Tire ambassador. Philip brought all of his friends and family to the big occasion, and the staff all chipped in and got him some great gifts, including a tent, fishing gear, stove, and even signed Jonathan Tabe's picture. We all have lives outside of the business, and, and we care about things, and this just seemed to touch a note with them, and, and, and they were just so generous with a, you know, a lot of the stuff they wanted to get. I think it was kind of awesome today, so yeah, yeah. Are you excited to get out and use it? Yeah, I'm excited to get out and use it, everybody, yep. <laughs> well, the store owner says when Philip turns old enough to work, they would love to find him a spot in their employee roster. What a fun day for him. Yeah, very nice story. Some nice mm. weather uh, today, Kasia. It's actually warming up, which probably means some snows in the forecast. That's right, we have been seeing warmer temperatures throughout the week and that will continue into this weekend and mid next week. Um, we're going to get some heavy snow tonight, but um, that, that will continue into tomorrow and getting about 15 centimeters of snow. Um, this morning we started with a wind chill of about minus 20 and as the day progressed it did get much warmer, an average of minus eight, with a daytime high of minus three. Uh, we had a bit of flurries around seven and nine this morning and they tapered off throughout the day and winds gusting up to 41 kilometers an hour. Now there's a special weather statement for the region, um, just surrounding the areas of Thunder Bay, they're going to get um, 20 plus centimeters of snow uh, by tomorrow night. Uh, like I said, just for Thunder Bay, we're only going to get about 15, and temperatures across the board seem pretty good, uh, all above minus 10. Uh, over to the west, they got an uh, average of minus 6 for most of the region. Some, some of the snow has already started for the Sioux Lookout area, and for Greenstone as well. But the Sioux Lookout had sunshine throughout the whole day and a temperature of minus 7. For tonight, like I said, that low pressure system is going to reach us and give us about 10 centimeters tonight. Uh, the wind chill is going to be minus 16 and winds, again, gusting up to 41 kilometers an hour and a low of minus 5. Um, for tomorrow, that low pressure system is going to give another 5 centimeters, but you can see the cold weather will follow right after. Uh, high pressure systems coming Saturday, so it should taper off, but I'll have more details for you later on in the news hour. Gotcha. Well, a controversial vote in Crimea today. Details on that story when we return. Without a doubt, without a doubt, we are happy, she says. We need peace. In Ukraine, it is a catastrophe.
Today, Crimea's regional parliament voted to split from Ukraine and join Russia. Canada, the U.S. and Europe denounced the move as illegal. But diplomacy is one thing, reality is another. And as Nala Ayad explains, on the ground in Crimea, the reality is Russia's grip is tightening. Swiftly, with little fanfare, they reached out to Russia. The current government voting overwhelmingly in favor. Though a referendum is scheduled to ratify the decision, it is effective immediately, says the region's deputy prime minister. The news, of course, played very well here outside of Parliament, where a number of Russian protesters have gathered. They would like to join Russia. That is their aim. Russia! A bombshell almost everywhere else. But in this crowd, turning to Russia isn't a turn at all. Not just today, but every day, they belong to Russia, making it official, inspired a party. Mir, mir, mir. Without a doubt, without a doubt, we are happy, she says. We need peace. In Ukraine, it is a catastrophe, chaos and bandits. Here, it's very good, she says. It may seem a sudden swivel, but the move in parliament reflects new facts on the ground. That Russian troops have taken control of most bases and the airport, possibly even a television station now. <laughs> Key will be the fate of Ukrainian troops. The Crimean deputy prime minister described them as occupiers who must either surrender or leave. The Ukrainian prime minister was outraged. This is illegitimate decision. And this so-called referendum has no legal grounds at all. Crimea was, is and will be an integral part of Ukraine. It's what about a third of Crimeans believe, and they do not want to join Russia. I am for Crimea to be with Ukraine, she says. I don't want to join criminal Russia. It doesn't take long for differences of opinion to play out. The minority Crimean Muslims called on residents to boycott the referendum. They warned the current quiet may not last long. Right now, the situation is under control, says Nariman Zilal, a member of the Crimean Council. But how will it develop later? On this, the first day of Crimea's turn, the worst clash was between pro-Russia militia and a topless protester opposed to Russian influence. Many deep-rooted opinions, but it's their voice that's the strongest now. Nala Ayed, CBC News, Semferopol, Ukraine. Well, after three days of silence, the president of the University of Ottawa spoke out today about two sex scandals swirling around campus this week. Alan Rock calls the incidents troubling, but insists his university is safe. Ashley Burke reports. This week, two scandals shook the University of Ottawa. It's all students have been talking about. But one person who hasn't been part of the public debate is the president of the university. Merci, Patrick. Until today, Alan Rock, who was once a student at the U of O, finally spoke out. And one of the things that's so appalling about the events and allegations of the last couple of weeks is that they stand in such shocking contrast to the values that I've known and internalized. The first scandal broke on Sunday after it became public the Student Federation president, Anne-Marie Waugh, had been the target of violent, sexually explicit comments online. The men behind it, four fellow student leaders. This is serious allegation. The very next day, the university announced police were investigating the men's varsity hockey team. It was alleged several members of the GGs sexually assaulted a woman while away at a game in Thunder Bay last month. Rock says he's also looking at the bigger picture. Today, he announced a new task force to promote respectful behavior on campus. We have to ask how well we send the message that all forms of sexualized violence are unacceptable and profoundly repugnant. Grave. In a heartfelt speech, the university's chancellor, former governor general, Michael Jean, said these types of incidents are the tip of an iceberg when it comes to society as a whole. The pervasiveness of misogyny, of women hating, of words and attitudes that contribute to gendered and sexual violence. Meanwhile, the students involved in the sexually threatening banter online will not be punished by the university. The men's hockey team is also allowed to attend classes since the allegations have not been proven.
Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. The head of Elections Canada, Mark Mayrand, was on Parliament Hill today. He was at a House of Commons committee to outline his concerns about the government's proposed changes to the Elections Act. But his appearance got off to a rocky start. Julie Van Dusen reports. Marc Mayrand, the head of Elections Canada, had time for a cigarette break, cooling his heels, waiting to appear at a Commons committee that was delayed. Mr. Flaherty. Mr. Flaherty. MPs were called into the Commons unexpectedly this morning by the government to vote not once, but twice on issues including a minor trade deal. This disgusting, this low, this un-Canadian. The NDP says it's obvious the government was trying to undermine Elections Canada. They have no respect for uh, public servants and they certainly have no respect for Monsieur uh, uh, Mayrand. Mayrand worked around the bells and votes to eventually tell MPs at committee they should amend the legislation. For one, he said, he won't be able to do outreach programs to encourage voting. I am unaware of any democracy in which such limitations are imposed on the electoral agency. Also, now, thousands of voters get others to vouch for their identity when they vote. Students, the elderly, Aboriginal Canadians, who often don't have ID with an address. That will change. My biggest concern is that at the end of the day, Canadians will be denied the right to vote. The government denies this, saying there will be 39 types of identification voters could use. I could go on, but there are many ID forms on that list of 39 that are specifically available to people who are in the retirement age. This legislation is crap. The opposition the says the line. bill won't correct the flaws of past elections. Things like robocalls, the in and out scandal, election cheating, um, the over expenditures, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. The only reason they're doing this is to stack the deck for the next election. What other reason could there be? The opposition party say they will need time to properly examine the 242-page bill. They'll have to work fast. The government wants it passed, unchanged, by June. Julie Van Dusen, CBC News, Ottawa. Some security analysts say hackers are turning their attention to smartphones. They're coming up with new ways to access all that sensitive information you carry with you every day. Aaron Saltzman has more on that and some tips for protecting your phone. If you've never given any thought to smartphone security, spyware has become a very big issue. One visit with Barry McCleary will change that. The former Mountie tests smartphones people suspect have been hacked, like the guy who thought his wife was using their phone to text a lover. Turns out... Spyware had been installed on his phone and the texts that he didn't know about were actually the phone giving his location. His wife, suspecting him of cheating, had installed spyware on the phone. Besides knowing his location, the wife could have had access to contacts, pictures, email and texts, listen to phone calls. In some programs, they also have the ability to turn your phone on silently where it acts as a live, live microphone. For that to happen, McCleary says the hacker has to have physical possession of the phone and know the password. But there are other vulnerabilities. Apple recently had a flaw, now fixed, that would have allowed hackers access to an iPhone's web browser if on the same Wi-Fi network. Hackers have implanted malicious programs in some Android apps and ported those apps to the BlackBerry market. If an app is very successful in a very short term, um, it could get off into an, onto a number of devices and then start attacking devices before it's caught. Compromised smartphones can be particularly devastating, says this advocate for victims of abuse. There are things that technology can do that are amazing, just really groundbreaking and innovative, but their potential to be misused by abusers has not been adequately looked at uh, by the people who design technology. Experts say you are your phone's best protection. Use a strong password. Keep the software up to date. Don't download an app or click on a link that looks suspicious. And above all, don't take smartphone security for granted. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. Canada's crippled HNCS prospector has finally docked. It was towed into Pearl Harbor in Honolulu, Hawaii just a few hours ago. Nearly 300 crew members were stuck at sea for about a week after an engine fire broke out. Chris Brown was there at the moment the ship came in. 
Seven days after a fire in the engine room crippled HMCS Protector, the ship arrived in Pearl Harbor this morning. It was pushed into its berth by two American tugs, and then the sailors began immediately to recover from their experience at sea. We heard a lot of stories about what happened when the fire broke out. And the generator caught fire, and I was actually right in front of the generator caught fire over top, and there's just a, an instant curtain of flames over top and it was left right completely over top and at that point it was just screaming fire 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 unbearable it was absolutely unbearable like i've never felt that much heat ever before in my life once we got in there into actually the engine room compartment it was so bad that a guy that was uh, three feet in front of me i couldn't see him i was relying on just his voice and being able to touch his tank to keep in contact with him the ship's captain was full of praise for the professionalism of his crew the team fought courageously that night to extinguish that fire. Yes, it's 45 years old and we've been out doing the business for the last uh, eight months since the ship came out of a refit. There's been no issues. Uh, the fact is ships sometimes have fires at sea. The crew members haven't had a shower, for example, in a week, so they'll obviously be looking to do that. But there's lots of work to do in the protector. Navy investigators will be going on board to really try to see what can be salvaged from the engine room. We haven't seen pictures of the damage, but we do know it's severe. And some of those we talked to said it would take an awful lot of work for Protector to ever be able to sail under its own steam again. Chris Brown, CBC News, Honolulu. Five well-known Canadians are breathing a sigh of relief after spending a week on the defensive. They were vying for the title of this year's Canada Reads winner. The annual reality show involves an animated, sometimes emotional debate Find out which novel the whole country should read. Zulek and Athu reveals the big win and the intense battle to get there. The Arenda by Joseph Boyden wins Canada Reads 2014. After days of debate, Joseph Boyden's historical novel took the crown, defended by journalist Wab Canoe. I really feel that this book has that potential to change Canada. <laughs> The Arenda explores the volatile relationship between Indigenous groups and settlers set in the 17th century. Boyden's book might have come out on top, but not without a passionate fight during the week. The violence, I think, is key to understanding the message of the Arenda. There have been major Aboriginal critics who say it's excessive. He went too far. The book Cockroach by Rowie Hudge was the runner-up. It was defended by Samantha Bee, a correspondent for the popular American program The Daily Show. Cockroach is a dark look at the alienation of an immigrant in Montreal who remains nameless. It got emotional at times. It's a reality that is really hard to read about, and, but it is real for hundreds of thousands of people. And it really moved me. Sorry. I'm manipulating you with my tears. I didn't expect to take it so seriously. I thought I'd be able to control that better, but I did, you know, I, I get really invested in things. And that's the whole point. The theme this year involved books that had potential to inspire social change. No one is expecting one show to change views overnight, but getting people interested is a start. I think it throws the spotlight on on, on these books and then I think it, it, the debates inspire people to read the novels. Canada wins here because there are five incredible books that I think that the entire country uh, should read. And the authors win too. The books involved in Canada Reads in the past have seen significant spikes in sales. Zulek Anathu, CBC News, Toronto. Well, before the break, let's take a look at the day's market activity. In Toronto, the TSX was down 32 points to 14,271. The Dow gained 61 points to close at 16,421. And the Nasdaq was down 6 points to 4,352. The Canadian dollar closed at 90.98 cents US, up 4 tenths. Gold closed at $1,351, up $11. And oil was up 11 cents to close at $101.56 per barrel.
Well, Thunder Bay's local hockey team on the road tonight to start off their playoffs. Yeah, could have some overtime. Uh, Windsor and uh, Thunder Wolves, uh, they've had two meetings this season. They've <laughs> mm -hmm. split the two, and they were both low-scoring affairs. So look for that trend to continue tonight. Well, your OU Thunder Wolves will be in Windsor this evening to open their best of three OUA West final with the Lancers. Both teams have had hot goaltending so far in the playoffs. The Wolves' Jeff Bosch has been lights out, while Windsor's Parker Van Busker was the primary reason his team upset Western in the semifinals. Now, Lakehead is hoping rookie forward Cody Alcock continues his playoff hot streak. He leads the OUA with six goals in only four games. Cody's strengths are his skating and his shot. I mean, if you really watch him, his, uh, his, uh, his jump from point A to point B is phenomenal. And, and when he gets around the, the net, obviously he can shoot the puck. But uh, I think he was a little dinged up there for a while back. He had a little bit of a sore shoulder, and I think he's got through it. Uh, and, uh, you know, his line mates, uh, Wilkie and uh, Grandi, have uh, complimented him fairly well. But uh, he, he's the guy that hopefully we can get some good looks around the net and uh, maybe find the back of the net. But uh, obviously playing pretty well. It started after Christmas and, and um, the way he's elevated in playoffs. And he's, he knows his role. He knows how important he is to this team. And he's, he's getting more comfortable. And you can see it every game. And, um, you know, the points are, are starting to show for him. Well, 10 games in the NHL tonight, including the Jets at home to L.A. We'll have that for you on Thunder Bay Television CKPR at 7 o'clock. Steven Stamkos returns from a broken leg as Tampa Bay welcomes Buffalo. Thomas Vanek makes his debut with Montreal as they visit Phoenix. Dallas entertains Vancouver and the Islanders are in Edmonton. Last night, after a scoreless first, Tyler Bozak is awarded a penalty shot early in the second. He'll make the most of that as he goes a stick side on Henrik Lundqvist for his 13th. Early in the third, Nikolai Kuhleman strips Anton Stroman of the puck. That will lead to Nazem Kadri's 16th as he whacks in a rebound. But the Rangers rallied to tie it at two with a pair of shorthanded goals, including the equalizer from ex-Leaf Dominic Moore in the third. They would need overtime to decide it, and it will be Bozak to the rescue on a nice little pass out from Phil Kessel as the Leafs win their first since the Olympic break ended, taking it 3-2. Next up after the celebrating, Calgary we go. It's the Flames spoiling Alash Hemsky's debut with Ottawa. Marcus Granlin opens the scoring with his first NHL goal. They would never look back, handing the Senators their fourth loss in their last 5-4-1. And in uh, Anaheim, that's Max Pacioretty with his 30th. They needed a shootout. Andre Markov with the winner there as the Habs end up uh, taking it as they continue their West Coast road trip 4-3 the final. Well, back to that Vancouver game tonight with Dallas. The Canucks have won only one of their last 11, but they're only two points behind Dallas for the final playoff spot in the Western Conference. The post-Roberto Luongo era begins with Eddie Lack, the new starter, now that Luongo was traded back to Florida earlier this week. Very, very weird day, to be honest. Uh, uh, shocked, uh, obviously. And, uh, and yeah, uh, I was getting ready to nap a little bit before the game, and Oli called, called, called me and told me I'm playing, so uh, it's been a very weird, weird, weird day, and, and uh, I'm very good either. What's he meant to your season, your first year? No, like, it's 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 tough. I mean, I'm, I'm losing a very good friend and, and uh, uh, a mentor for for me, but but uh, it's going to be, be uh, important we get, the, get back on the horse here and start winning. Well, I don't think anybody was thinking about it during the game. Obviously, uh, you know, when everybody woke up from their nap, they, they heard the news and it was pretty shocking. And, uh, you know, let's face it, it's a major move. It's a major deal. Uh, it was a major part of this team for a long time. And, you know, uh, all the records he has here and the best goalie in franchise history and all that stuff, like he was he was a huge part of this team. So obviously there, there was some talk and it's going to take, uh, you know, some time. We're going to move on. But uh, once once it was game time, Know, our, our focus on these two points, and this was a big game for us, and it's disappointing right now. We knew that he wanted to play there, his family's there, and that um, he felt strongly about it, and, um, and we're happy that we had an opportunity to get him back to where he, he wanted to be. He's been a huge part of the Canucks. Um, he deserves that, and uh, we wish him the best of luck. Hope he does well. The Thunder Bay North Stars got a hat trick last night from Robert McLean as they hammered the Ice Dogs in Dryden uh, 8 to 2. Kerry Brown also added a pair. The two teams hook up again tonight in Dryden. At the Briar and Kamloops BC this afternoon, John Morris against Jeff Stoughton. Pick it up in the eighth end. Manitoba takes a 6 5 lead as the three time Briar champ and draws to the back of the four foot. Give him a deuce. 
This one would need an extra end and it's Stoughton with Hammer. And watch the vet hand BC only their second loss this week and prevent them from going to the one versus two page playoff game with a takeout for the single and a 7-6 victory. Both those ranks are playoff bound at 8-2. And, and Northern Ontario's Jeff Curry is trying to remove Newfoundland's rock from the button, but as you're about to see, he will fail to do so. So that will give Brad Gushu uh, the victory. Didn't even have to throw his final stone as he wins at 7-6. Curry, uh, it's been a Brutal week for him. He falls to 2-8, and eight, and he'll wrap up uh, play against Quebec's Jean-Michel Menard in the late draw. The Blue Jays' Grapefruit League game in Florida with the Pirates has been rained out. Ah, oh, rain. I remember rain. Uh, Toronto's preseason record is 4-4. Four and four. And the next generation of Canadian racers like James Hinchcliffe and Paul Tracy, they got their hot rods out at an elementary school in Toronto this week. You've heard of go-kart racing. How about the second annual Cardboard Hot Rods event? Here's Rob Lath. If you have ever dreamed about fulfilling your need for speed, chances are your dream did not involve cardboard and duct tape. There are four rails on the car, which makes it really strong. And uh, since it's a shorter car, it can hold more weight. These young gearheads at St. Raymond Catholic School set out to put the pedal to the corrugation. Uh, today is our cardboard car competition. It was basically um, spawned from the cardboard boat race which is run by Skills Canada. Uh, we ended up with a little bit of extra cardboard and I thought well what fun things could we do with it. Inspiration coming from classic car designs and grandmothers. Our friend told us a joke about when her grandma's mad she's Hussein Bolt on slippers. So we decided to name our car after Bolt. And then our design, we, in, we decided to put flames in it, so we decided to name it the Flaming Bolt. Fresh off the assembly line, it was time to see what these prototypes could pull off. Horsepower replaced by kid power and gravity. Most of them did very, very well on the distance travel. They uh, went right down the ramp and as far as possible, which gave them the 10 points that they needed. They didn't always go straight. She's going a little bit left. But as it turns out, you don't have to go straight to win. The Ghost Division. Yeah! We were hoping to get to the end if we could, but even though we didn't, we still came in first. Amazing, yeah. amazing. <laughs> and they may not break any land speed records, but still, watch out. The first vehicle I ever had. <laughs> Uh, the Indianapolis Colts have signed linebacker Dequel Jackson to a four-year, $22 million contract. He was recently released by Cleveland at the PGA Tour's Puerto Rico Open. American Brian Stewart has the clubhouse lead, open with a 6-under-66. That's a one-stroke lead on Jason Gore and Danny Lee. Can is uh, Stephen Ames, a shot of 70 and trails by four. And uh, UFC 171 is coming up next weekend in Dallas. Johnny Hendricks against Robbie, Robbie Lawler for the vacant welterweight title, which used to be held by Georges St. Pierre, who's taking an extended break. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned it earlier in sports. Tonight, the Jets are on the ice against L.A. With uh, your full viewing lineup, here's Teletalk. Tonight on Global Thunder Bay, starting at 8 on About a Boy, Will babysits Marcus so Fiona can go on a job interview. At 8.30 on the Millers, Carol tries to join Nathan on his vacation getaway in the Bahamas. Then at 9 p.m. on Rake, Keegan's feud with the mayor puts his client's plea deal in jeopardy. And at 10 on Elementary, a man suspected of murdering his wife receives a ransom demand. Over on CKPR Thunder Bay at 7, the LA Kings brave the cold to take on the Jets in Winnipeg. At 11 on A Season Like No Other, foes become teammates once again on frigid Soldier Field. And at 12.35, George has Canadian writer, director Michael Dows in the red chair. Teletalk is brought to you by Points, the traffic ticket specialists.
You know, Randy's really excited to have to shovel tomorrow, Kasha. We are expected to get a fair amount of snow overnight, right? That's right. And I actually heard that he likes shoveling other people's driveways, too. Yeah, I heard and that, too. <laughs> so oh, we're really? going to get about 15 <laughs> centimeters by tomorrow night. So if you, if you need anyone, I think you should give him a call, and he'll be there free of charge. Um, but yes, that's right. We are going to get a lot of snow. For today, we didn't. We saw a few flurries this morning between 7 and 9, but that tapered off throughout the day and mostly cloudy otherwise. Uh, we had a high of minus 3. The wind chill was minus 20 this morning, and we had an average more so of minus 8 and warmer as the, the day progressed, with winds gusting up to 41 kilometers an hour from the south to southwest. Um, looking across the country, there are some, uh, there's a snowfall warning for the southern provinces of BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. They're going to get about 10 to 15 centimeters of snow. But throughout the day today, Vancouver had wet, uh, wet conditions for them, but plus 10, so they had nice temperature. And then completely opposite for Prince George with minus 8 um, and some uh, precipitation as well. Edmonton and Calgary, same temperature, minus 15, and some uh, sunshine throughout the day. And over in Saskatoon and Regina, they both had uh, precipitation throughout the day and not much variance in their, in their uh, temperatures. And over in Winnipeg, they have minus 7 and some precipitation. Looking at southern Ontario, as we shift over there, uh, Toronto had a pretty nice day uh, with a temperature right now of minus 6, clear skies throughout the day, Ottawa minus 12, and Quebec City, same temperature, clear skies. Looking in the Maritimes, snow messy weather for them, which is a nice change. Um, temperatures all ranging pretty much above minus 10 and clear skies for them. And St. John's just a bit colder with minus 12. You can see the weather system in our region, that low pressure is, system is going to bring a lot of precipitation into the whole region. And um, it well into tomorrow night, and then it should taper off by Saturday. And you can see that high pressure system will follow, uh, bringing a bit colder temperatures for next week. Uh, like I said, the, pressure, the low pressure system will bring precipitation across the region, so it has already started throughout the day for the western part of the, of the, of the region and will continue throughout tonight. Temperatures uh, hovering around minus 10, not too cold, and Big Trout Lake about minus 21. And the precipitation has already started for Greenstone, but not quite yet for Sault Ste. Marie. Um, they got a temperature of minus 11 tonight, but that snowfall will hit them by tomorrow. Um, Greenstone will have minus four on the freezing line for Sault Ste. Marie, and it should be completely out of the, the west area and temperatures all above minus 10. Uh, currently, if you're heading out right now, we got a temperature of minus two, so that is our new daytime high, and a wind chill of minus eight, mostly cloudy right now, and uh, winds just gusting up to 13 kilometers an hour. And looking into tonight, uh, a temperature of minus 5, which isn't bad at all, but the wind chill is going to feel more like minus 16, and about 10 centimeters tonight, and like I said, tomorrow is when we're going to reach about 15 centimeters. Now looking at the extended forecast, you can see Friday, like I said, 15 centimeters. We're going to get uh, about 0 and, uh, and a low of minus 16. Saturday and Sunday, we're going to get a nice weekend for us. Um, the, the seasonal temperature for this time of year is minus 3, so we're going to get that tomorrow. And then Sunday, we're actually, Sunday and Monday, we're both in the pluses. So that's a really good news and mainly sunny. And then on Tuesday, you can see temperatures will drop much colder to minus 6 and a uh, high, a low of minus 26. So going into next week, we are going to see uh, more so to seasonal temperatures, and that trend is going to continue throughout March. So um, there's also going to be a couple of weather systems tapering into next week, but right for tonight and tomorrow is when we're going to get most of our snowfall. So you're just going to need the shovels for tomorrow. Now let's head to the local Humane Society where tonight we have a special treat, three dogs to show you. Here's Fiona Gardner with Rocky, Cash and Riker. Hi, this week's Humane Society Pet of the Week is a trio of dogs whose adoption fees have been waived. Now the first one is Rocky here, who is a two-year-old Doberman who is found as a stray. And uh, what we can tell is that he's very smart, needs some training, but does not like other dogs. Now the next dog is Cash, who is a one-year-old Shepherd Cross, who was brought in because he was just too much energy for his owner. We think a little bit of exercise will get him right on track. 
And the third is Riker, who is a one and a half year old Collie Cross who is on medication, but is a lot of fun and very sweet. Your Pet of the Week has been brought to you by Thunder Pet, expert advice and high quality pet food within your budget. A lot of you probably don't know this, but uh, back in the day, Randy would actually climb on Ferris wheels and change light bulbs. So he obviously- For an extra dime an hour. Not afraid of heights, obviously. <laughs> Kasia has gone skydiving, obviously also not afraid of heights. If you are afraid of heights, you might want to not stick around for this next story, or you might, and see if you can handle it. Details when we return. if you suffer from vertigo, you may want to close your eyes for the next 30 seconds or so. These two daredevils climbed up Shanghai Tower, China's tallest building, without any safety equipment, just like Shafi with the Ferris wheel. It took the pair nearly two hours to reach the 120th floor, 
Chinese authorities are now demanding better security. The climbers posted this video on YouTube and it immediately hit its own heights. More than 29 million views in less than a month. Spectacular video, but terrifying at the same time. Wow. Now you get used to it. You, you have no fear of dying, I guess. That's yeah, it looks like a lot of fun. We're going to recap our top story now. Well, new documents show that lawyers on behalf of the Fort William First Nation are calling on the province to prohibit Horizon Wind from developing on treaty lands. And the OUA West Final starts in uh, Windsor tonight for your Lakehead Thunderwolves. We'll have the result, plus a busy night in the NHL, including the Holly's beloved Jets. Uh, well, I'll highlight to them <laughs> later on. He's speechless because I'm going to be screaming at the TV all night. That's your early look at news, weather, and sports. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good night.